Good morning or evening, whenever you happen to be seeing this, we welcome you to the Assembly of God here in Seaside as we looking at us on Facebook or YouTube. We want God to bless you. That's why we're here to bring you a blessing through the name of Jesus Christ. And you know, there's a scripture verse I used just a little earlier, and I'd like to share part of that with you. For we all face some difficulties, we all face times when, <clears throat> excuse me, we're just not sure which end is up. But Psalms 118 says this, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has, <clears throat> he has become my salvation. And so as you worship with us this morning, remember whatever you're going through, God is your salvation. God is your strength. Father, we thank you for your love. We pray now as we worship you, as we are joined by many uh, through the uh, use of the electronics, YouTube, and Facebook, that you will bless them. Bless your word, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. to serve, I will serve you, Lord. May that be the prayer of all of our hearts. Praise God. Praise God. Well, somehow, that song does fit with our theme of following the call. Amen. Jesus calls, and we must answer. We must follow. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. We've been on this theme. This is part 14. Who knew that was going to happen? Part 14 of following the call. Now, if you have the handout, you'll notice it's also on the front and on the back. You know, when I fix a salad, the bag has two kinds of lettuce and some diced carrots and that's it, and that's how I fix up a salad. When my wife makes a salad, by the time she's done it has 15 or 20 or more ingredients. It has the two kinds of lettuce and the, and the shredded carrots. But she'll add some 
some tomatoes and celery and chopped up onions and it grew some. And she'll add some chopped up peppers and cheese chunks and it grew some. And she'll add some chopped nuts and by the time it's 15 or 20 I call it a gruesome salad. So in preparing this message it would have fit on one page. But some more verses came to my mind and it grew some. And some more verses came to my mind and it grew. so you have a gruesome handout to go with her. Okay, so we um, have been following the call of Jesus. We looked at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, and we also looked in Luke chapter 6, Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. And I can hear you saying, but what about Mark and John? Did they say that Jesus had people call, gather to him and he taught them? Let's look at Mark chapter 10, verse 1. If you have this, let's read it together. And he left Capernaum and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. Well, Mark confirms that. Let's read John chapter 8, verse 2 together. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Thank you, Lord. Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Healer, Jesus the Teacher. We gather to you so that you may teach us, Lord. We draw near because you redeem us from our sins, you heal us from our diseases, you comfort our hearts, you're king of our lives, and you teach us. Help us to hear, to answer the call, to hear you and to follow you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So looking in Mark chapter 10, one of the occasions that we just read about, where as was his custom, Jesus, when crowds came to him, he took the opportunity to teach. Obviously we know that there were some, Jesus' own words tell us that there were some, he said, you came because you are hoping to have bread and fish again. You came for the miracle meal again. Others came for healing, to be delivered from demons. But in every opportunity that he had, he looked for opportunities to teach people to be like him, to surrender our hearts and become kingdom citizens and kingdom children. And so he taught, and in this Mark chapter, now in Mark and in John, the focus a lot is on the parables, on the healing ministry, and on the conflict with those who were the religious leaders who were opposed to God's plan of the Messiah having come. And they didn't like that. They liked their position. So in Mark and in John, not a lot is, is fitting with a, a lengthier teaching session like we have in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, or in Luke 6, the Sermon on the Plain. But in Mark 10, after Jesus had answered a question, he then gives us a wonderful little passage here, Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. It's interesting that people think that, that faith is just for adults. But you know what? Children are the most open, most ready to receive. And God's heart is for those children. Not waiting until they've become, their hearts have been crushed over with their own excuses um, for their lives or, their, or having been pursued by, by those who would take, take them astray or having allowed the devil free run in their lives. The Lord wants to touch the hearts of the little ones. Amen. And Jesus loves the little children. Sure so when Jesus saw it, he was, it says, when the disciples rebuked them, he, Jesus was indignant with them. One translation said he was furious with them. How many want Jesus to be furious with you? Not me. I want Jesus to be happy with what, the way that I respond Amen. to the, those around that he wants to bless. And he said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. Don't put a stumbling block in the path of children coming to Jesus and hearing about his love and being blessed by him. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Now this powerful 16th verse, or 15th verse, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. The disciples had talked about who's the greatest in the kingdom. Well, I think I'm the greatest. I think I'm going to sit next to Jesus by his throne. I'm the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus said, if you don't have a childlike heart, you don't even get in. You don't, even, you, you don't even have a pass to get in the door into the kingdom of God. One translation says, 
you will by no means enter it. Another translation says, you will never enter it. It's a very strong word there in the original that Jesus spoke. And he said, if you don't have this childlike heart, you will never enter the kingdom. Now I looked at various Bible commentaries as to what they think Jesus was implying here on being like a child. And it kept circling, circ some people had a few odd ideas, but overall there was a consistent theme to be childlike in that we just come, we just trust, we just have an open heart. Just come to Jesus. There are people who want to um, know more before they give their heart to the Lord. I need to answer this question. I need to answer that theological question. Well, explain this Bible verse to me. Well, how come this and how come God does this and how come does, doesn't do that? And, and more and more and more. And you know what? Just come. He calls, just come. A child doesn't come with all this reservation. A child doesn't come with all kinds of baggage and bias. A child just comes. If you do not become like a child when it comes to, to the kingdom of God, you won't even have a chance to get in the door. But that's the entry level. It's simply trusting with an open heart. Just come to him. Years ago in a church service, I had completed my portion of the service. Um, and I went and sat down with my wife in the congregation as the lead pastor began the sermon. And from a couple rows behind, up came this little fellow, I think about five years old. This boy came up and sat down next to me. And after the service, his mother said to me, her son had asked, can I go sit with the president? <laughs> now, I think associate pastor maybe um, was too big of a word for him, sometimes in like minister's settings other fellow pastors, I would introduce myself as the sociopath, associate pastor. And I'd say, you know what, the, the you know, saying it and, and meaning it, sometimes it feels like the same thing. But, you know, he, he couldn't say associate pastor, but he, he knew that word president. And he came and sat next to me for, the, for the, that portion of the service. And what, what was precious to me, and still is, was that that boy knew that I was okay with him coming and sitting next to me. And that his mother knew that it was okay with me for her son to come sit next to me. If children don't like to be around you, there's a big problem, folks. Children should be very comfortable being around you. Come with a childlike heart. We are children of God. Romans 8:16 says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How many are the children of God? Come on. We are. We are. It doesn't say you're going to become... You are. When you, when you come to him and he forgives your sins and you receive him as your Lord and Savior and he comes and lives within our lives, you know what do we find out? We find out that we are children of God. Amen. And not necessarily with an attitude of, of saying that I have something that other people don't have, neener, neener, you know, what I, but rather that I am somebody who has been allowed to be adopted into the family of God. Hallelujah been brought into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God witnesses in our spirits. You know it, you feel it, don't you? Amen. You sense it, you know you have eternal life. You know that you're a child of God. Sometimes we feel like maybe we deserve a spanking, and maybe we do. We're still the children of God, aren't we? I'm a child of God, yes I am. We sing that new song. We are the children of God, so we follow the call. Welcome to the kingdom. You are a servant of the kingdom, you're a citizen of the kingdom, and you are a child of the king in this kingdom. Praise God. Yes. So don't get an attitude about it other than an attitude of submission, surrender, and joy. Amen. That's our attitude is the joy that we have. Amen. Some additional scripture regarding the kingdom of God and what are the components of our attitude. Romans 14 verse 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let's look at righteousness. 1 Timothy 2.5 says that the only mediator between God and mankind is the man, Christ Jesus. Mediator. I didn't say meteor. I said mediator. I didn't say radiator. I said mediator. We need a mediator. We can't fix the guilt of our sin ourselves. We can't fix our guilt of our sin with medication. People will turn to various medicines to try to resolve their, their emotional feelings, their ups and downs, their moods. Some people, you know, food isn't necessarily medicine, but, 
but the foods that we eat do interact with, with how we feel, and there's a relationship between body and soul. And some people get feeling blue, they go to the refrigerator and find some comfort food and start snacking and snacking and snacking, trying to resolve the emotional issues in their, in, within their spirit. Or some people will turn to drugs or alcohol or something else. And some people will take medicines either over the, over the counter or get their doctor to prescribe certain medications. And there are some people that, that there are, are, are imbalances within their chemistry of their body and they need doctor's care. I understand that. But we cannot fix the guilt of sin with medication because sin, the guilt of sin is not an emotional issue. And it's not even a chemical issue within us. It's a deep core of who we are in our very soul. If you're a sinner, you need a savior. So you're not going to fix the guilt of sin with medication. We're not going to fix the guilt of sin with meditation. There are people who want to sit cross-legged and stare at their belly button and say om and think that's going to fix the guilt of sin. You know what? There are things to be said about calming down. We know that. I'm not, I'm not speaking in favor of certain practices, but I'm saying that, that reminding ourselves to quiet our thoughts and calm down and think about peace, that has benefit, obviously. If you're agitated in spirit, um, then there are ways that we can calm ourselves. But the, when it comes to the guilt of sin, that's not going to fix it. Because the guilt of sin is not a matter of our emotional state. It's a deep set of our soul that is wrong before God and needs to be fixed. We can't resolve the guilt of sin with medication. We cannot resolve the guilt of sin with, with meditation. But we need mediation. Mediation. He is the mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Christ, our mediation, our mediator. That means his righteousness planted in us and growing in us. His righteousness planted in us and growing in us. Other ways of saying mediator, most Bible translations that I could find use that term mediator. It's an official title. Aren't you glad he's still in that role? Yeah. What he did on the cross, he's still doing for us. Amen because of the cross. He's still the mediator. It can mean intermediary. It could mean the bringer together er er. Bringer together er er er. Put all the ers you want on that, but he's the one who brings us together with God the Father. That's what mediator means. He stands there with the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's often been said, Jesus said, I love you this much. And he opened his arms wide and gave his life for us to redeem us. He's the mediator because of the cross. That, that gulf that our sins caused is now bridged. We come to God through Jesus Christ. Righteousness. Not of our own righteousness. None of us can be righteous in ourselves. But by his Holy Spirit, the righteousness of Christ is planted in us and grows in us. And causes us to live righteous lives. And God demands it. We can't just set righteousness as a future goal and saying, I, I'm trying, Lord. We cannot excuse sin in our lives and say, well, I'm only human. God has called us to be redeemed, to be like him, to follow the call. Amen. Matthew 5, 8, we read this when we talked about the Sermon on the Mount. The pure in heart shall see God. We have to be pure hearted, don't we? Hebrews 12, 14 says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We must choose to let his Holy Spirit build that righteousness and that holiness within our lives. We must reject the temptations of sin that come our way. The cross makes the impossible possible. Righteousness is impossible. The cross makes it possible. Aren't you glad for what Jesus did? Hebrews 9 verse 26 says that Jesus came to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He came to put those sins away so that they're not constantly bothering us. We are not to be constantly battling against sin. Oh, we, we resist the devil and he flees from us. We are to stand firm against the fiery darts of the enemy. But we are to stand victorious. We are not to fall. In 1 John, he said, these things I write to you that, you that you do not sin. If we sin, we have an advocate, and we can confess our sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But these things we write that you do not sin. That's God's plan, that we do not live lives of constantly falling into sin and, and um, needing constant, um, constant looking over of, of what are my true motives. If I truly love God, I'm not going to choose to fail him. I'm going to choose to obey him and follow his call and live for him because of the, my love for him. So he made, the, made it possible. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Titus 2 verse 14, 
He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. There are things that work within our minds, within our spirits, within our bodies to try to take us away and cause us to fall and fail. But he gave himself to redeem us from that. There is power in the cross. There is power in the blood. Power for you and me. I think I can almost hear you saying amen. amen. There is power in the blood. There is power in the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. To, to save me and to keep me. To keep me walking consistently before him. The kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Peace. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's a whole sermon series right there in those two verses, isn't it? All the power words that are packed into there. It's amazing. We're justified by faith. Aren't you glad you're justified? We talked about this last week, that we're more than pardoned, because at least in contemporary terminology, legal terminology, if you're pardoned, the, the infractions and the felonies and the crimes are still on the record, but you're pardoned. But with justification, he's removed the record. Hallelujah. We stand in him completely as if it had never happened. We stand before him innocent. We're justified by faith. Put your faith in him. Don't put your faith in your own ability to raise your faith up, to try to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps in terms of spiritual faith. Our faith rests in him. We put our faith in him. We're justified by that faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith. We can enter in by, into this grace by which we stand. We stand in his grace, don't we? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. God favors us. We are in this condition of, of being the children of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice. Joy is here. And hope is here. And God is glorified. A commentary on this said, Peace is more than a calm feeling. It is the cessation of hostilities. It's unconditional surrender. It's full reconciliation with God. Peace with God brings the peace of God to the soul. Amen. The peace, our peace with God brings the peace of God to your soul. Aren't you glad? That Jesus Christ created the peace terms. And it's unconditional surrender on our part because I have nothing to defend myself with against the charges of the Almighty God that I've, I've failed, I've sinned, I've departed from the destiny of good that he had planned for my life. And so I come just surrendering. And guess what? Jesus said, I've taken care of it. I've taken care of it. It's healed. It's mended. The relationship is restored. Peace with God brings the peace of God to your soul. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad that joy is prominent among the, the teachings of Scripture, that God wants us to live joyful lives, no matter what the circumstances are? I love that statement when somebody said, um, under the circumstances, and somebody said, what are you doing under there? We don't live under the circumstances. We live... The circumstances are around us, whatever they are, but we live joyfully. We live above the trials of life. Speaking of the fruit of the Spirit, we find that in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Aren't you glad they can't legislate your joy away from you? Amen. There may be some who are trying. Uh, that's, that's not got too far down that trail, but you know what? Um, I've thought people want to do their job. So lawmakers, they get into office. Well, to do their job, they have to make laws then, if they're lawmakers. And as if we don't have enough laws already. But at least they can't make a law against your love and against your joy and against your peace with God. Praise God. There's no law against that. So what's, what's restraining you? What's withholding entering into the full joy of the Lord? Full joy. Joy in the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit wants us to experience that joy, to rejoice in his hope and the grace that we have. In Mark chapter 4, which we referenced, there was a teaching that Jesus gave there that was another way of rephrasing statements that he made on the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. As you recall, in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made certain statements there, and then a little later on, perhaps not quite a year later, the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus used some of the same illustrations, same way of th saying things, but 
put a little nuance of difference to it at that setting. We have a nuance of difference in a similar statement in Mark chapter 4. We begin at verse 21. Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is a similar statement to start with, with what Jesus taught in Matthew 5. But there he said, you're a city set on a hill, you're a light that's set to light the room. And so he's encouraging people to, to glow spiritually toward those around it. But here he's talking about you can't hide. If you do not willingly shine your light, Jesus will make your light shine anyway. He's going to remove the barriers anyway. So we are not hidden. If you try to hide your testimony, the Lord will, will push you into an opportunity where you can't hide it any longer. That's the way he is. That's just the way he is. So let's just willingly be that light. Let's share and pass it on. And whatever is measured to you, more will be added to you. The measure you use, it will be measured back to you and more. The one who has, more will be given. From the one who has, even what he has will be taken away. So that when we're, we have the joy of the Lord in our hearts, more joy is coming. As we are light to those around us, God's going to draw others to that light. Whoever is open in witnessing and sharing their faith, God's going to find ways of getting people to you. Amen. You know what I'm saying? The more that you're open, the more that you're reflecting the light of Christ in the lives around you, the more that you try to represent Jesus in the way that you live, the way that you talk, the way that you act, the Lord's going to bring people into your life so that you can shine because he's, the Lord is almost desperately trying to bring them into the kingdom as well. Yeah. And if we try to, to reject people who, um, you know, sin makes, really, really trashes people's lives. Sin makes a mess of people's lives. And sometimes we, we're maybe repulsed by people with messy lives. You know what? There but for the grace of God go I. Yeah. We can all say without Christ I'm a mess anyway. I'm not any higher, any better. So the more I can, I can have the kind of of compassion that Jesus had. Jesus was called a friend of sinners. And the religious leaders said, how dare you go hang out with those kind of people? Yeah. And Jesus said, the sick need a doctor. I'm their spiritual doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so you're, you're the, the doctor's assistant. How's that way of saying it? <laughs> Spiritually. That the more that you show caring for the messy lives around you, and the more that you want to shine the light of, light of Jesus to those around you who need it, the more the Lord's going to find ways to get them around you so that his light can shine through you. And if we're, we're resistant to letting our testimony get out there, it's kind of a lonely life. But he said, you're not going to be hidden. I'm not going to put you under the basket. I'm not going to put you under the bed. I'm going to shine your light whether you want it to shine or not. And the more that, that the Lord pours into your life, the more the Lord is going to pour back out from your life to those around you. Share it and pass it on. The kingdom of God is all about the king, and that's Jesus. It's a kingdom because we have a king. You know, at the baptism of Jesus, it's referenced in Luke chapter 3, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved son. Then later in Luke chapter 9, at the transfiguration, a voice came from the clouds and spoke to the disciples and said, This is my beloved son. Do you know what the, the background meaning on that is? What's the meaning of the name David? Beloved. How many prophecies throughout the scriptures prophesied that there would come a king who would be on the throne of David? There would be one like unto King David, an everlasting kingdom on the throne of David. Numerous prophetic scriptures. The voice came from heaven two times saying, this is my David. This is my beloved. That's the meaning of the word of David. And God was confirming, this is my King David. My, my eternal King David. Not the original one who was a lot of pluses, some minuses, but was representative of the, of the eternal kingdom. And the true David, the true beloved one, that voice came saying, this is my David. This is my beloved. This is my king that I brought to you. In Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 31, the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary and said, call his name Jesus. Jesus means Jehovah Savior. He will be great 
will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. I don't want it to end. I want it to be forever, and aren't you glad? Amen. We got it right. It is forever. So some quick statements about his kingdom. John 1, 18, verse 36. My kingdom, Jesus said, is not of this world. Isaiah 32, verse 1. A king will reign in righteousness. It's not about political power. It's not about cultural acceptance. It's about the righteousness that comes through Christ alone. Hebrews 7, 2. He is the king of peace. Revelation 15, 3 says he is the king of saints. I'm going too fast. You can't write this down on your notes. He's the king of peace. He's the king of saints. Revelation 19, verse 16, he is the king of kings. Anything that wants to rise up and declare itself to be royal or regal or having any authority, he is over top of all of that. Amen. He's the one who can, who can rule righteously and all, all authorities surrender to him. And I surrender to him as well. Amen. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1:17. he is the king eternal. Forever and ever, Jesus Christ is king. And you belong to him. You are a child of the king. You're a child of the kingdom, a servant, a citizen. And we follow the call. He is the one who shines and leads the way. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. We thank you, Lord, that you are king of our lives, king of our hearts, and we follow you, Lord. We pray, God, that you will invade our thoughts, Lord, and our motives and our understandings of who we are and what we are to do and how we are to live our lives. We're to follow Jesus and to be like Jesus with the caring and the compassion. And Lord, we just pray that you will cause us to understand the authority that we have in using your name against the works of the enemy, Lord. We have power in the name of Jesus. And at the name of Jesus, everything must submit and surrender. And Lord, in your name, we surrender ourselves to you. And we thank you for this time together in your word. And I pray, Lord, for anyone hearing these words and watching this message today. If there's anything that's not right within their heart and life, Lord, that they will surrender that now and ask for full forgiveness because of what Jesus did on the cross. You died and rose again to redeem us from our sins and to be Lord of our lives now and forever. King Jesus, we, uh, we, we magnify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.